to Beating a Dead Horse. As always, I am your host, Sean McKenda. And despite everything, it's still your host, Jackson Keller. And, you know, despite everything is a great way to launch into what we're talking about, because as literally every every company under the fucking sun has said in their press releases and their ads and everything else, it's been a tough year for all of us. It's, it's one of those hard times, which is why you need a bacon Big Mac right now, and it will solve all of your problems. I'll, I'll tell you what made my year more miserable was every every company doing that. And it's like, shut the fuck, shut the fuck up, Dan, from marketing. You don't know suffering. <laughs> I know you don't. <laughs> you don't understand the depths of our suffering. You don't get it. Uh, but listen, we, we joke about suffering up front because we're not here to talk about suffering. We're going to flip the script and we're only going to talk about the things that were good in 2020 because we all know it's been a shit year. Fuck that. Nobody wants to hear us bemoan the fact that we got to see four movies in theaters this year. And the last one I got to see was The Hunt. We've talked about that. It sucks. No one wants to hear us talk about that again. Least of all, us. We're tired of it. We want to have a, just a good, fun, positive episode. So for this year's horsies, we're not going to sit down. We're not going to have nominations. We're not going to have best ofs. We're not going to have any of that shit. It's just going to be like a casual, fun conversation about the things that brought us joy and made us happy and helped us get through this year and things that you can take and play and do and watch yourself. So... Fun, happy, yeah, yeah, hell yeah, and not even necessarily stuff that uh, we talked about the show. We will talk about some stuff that we brought up on the show, but the I, I think it, speaking only for myself, the majority of what I want to talk about is stuff that either I only mentioned in passing on the show as like a point of comparison, or just you know stuff completely outside of that that I've been doing on my own. And I suspect Sean that a lot of your little uh, cobbled together list is the same way. Yeah, I, I feel like we're gonna, probably going to spend a decent bit of time talking about video games uh, because we both are huge players of video game or games. I'm not going <laughs> to say gamers. I refuse to call ourselves Embrace gamers. Embrace it. Embrace it. Gamers rise up, Sean. Uh, but we, we both play a ton of video games and we don't talk <laughs> about them that often on the podcast. They're they're kind of a, a little treat every now and again, uh, but they take so much time and effort to like get prepared for an episode that we don't do it that often. So I feel like we're going to spend a lot of time talking about video games that we enjoyed and played this year. Some new, some very old, some very, very old. I've played some old games this year. Uh, I, I also played some old games. I, I, I'll i talk about this a little bit more. I did a lot of deep dives where I played through um, an entire series. And uh, just just to get this on the record, I know that I've been alluding to a video game project. Um, I ended up replaying some of my favorite games of all time this year as part of that project. Uh, as a standard protocol, obviously I want to say what I want to say about those things when the time comes and the project goes live. So I will not be mentioning them here. These are other uh, similar criteria to my uh li bonus episode list uh that it's either stuff that i hadn't seen or played before or stuff that i had but had such a like radically different impression of that functionally it may as well have been different but that's that's just a me uh like limitation i place upon myself so sean has no such limitation for his own list just just keeping that just putting that up front i gave myself absolutely zero limitations uh there's one kind of overlap of thing that i've watched before but i never finished it before uh so it's it's functionally a new thing but like like, it, these are also just things that, like, I, I tend to gravitate towards the next thing. I don't tend to get stuck in, you know, things that I've watched in the past, with some exceptions. Bob's Burgers is not on my list, but, I mean, I guess shout-outs to Bob's Burgers, a series that I've watched so many times that I it, it, it is my ultimate comfort food. I just love it so very, very much. Uh, so I guess just, just as a quick pre, pre-horsies shout-out. Bob's Burgers, y'all. It's a it's a great, comforting show that is all in all weird, kind of gross, but like just so fucking wholesome. It is. I when it, it started off, I kind of described it as Family Guy by way of King of the Hill. 
Um, and I, I kind of stand by that. I, I think it, it's got way more King of the Hill energy than Family Guy energy. Uh, yeah. Because Family Guy sucks. Family Guy is trash <laughs> garbage dookie. Uh, but like this has the, the wholesomeness of King of the Hill, but like with a bit more of a juvenile edge i would say like king of the hill has an edge but far more on like a political we're gonna poke some beasts is 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 it millennial king of the hill like that kind of energy because king of the hill is pretty gen x um like especially early king of the hill that's not a terrible way to compare it honestly uh again i don't think it necessarily delves into issues like king of the hill was always fairly political or like had a statement to be made with yeah it was, it was pretty satirical yeah bob's burgers is far more like hopeful artist type of thing like it's it doesn't have as much of a political lean to it but it's a lot of it's like bob is a struggling blue collar businessman who wants to get on his own as a, as an artiste as a as a cook uh and like that's really relatable in a lot of ways to my own life and like how that all shakes out so there's there's some it, it's kind of like a, a king of the hill for People who want to do creative things because they're just episodes that hit harder. But also, as I said, it's just a wholesome fucking show. Highly recommended. Hell yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're coming out strong. We're coming out positive. Um, I, I, I guess with, with the preamble sort of out of the way, do we want to like we have a broad structure. We have some broad categories of stuff that we talked about. Do we want to like sort of do the closest thing to traditional horsies and shout out, um, you know, stuff that we talked about on the show? Yeah, yeah. let's start with things that we talked about on the show and really stuck out to us. Like a lot of this stuff we've already talked about extensively in episodes. Sometimes we've referred back to and have had essentially multiple episodes on. But, you know, we, we just want to be like, hey, these are the things that were really great this year and things that you should look for if you haven't listened to these episodes or just, you know, have stuck with us longer than other things. So, Jackson, what, give give us give us a positive note. Uh, so I guess if if we're starting with stuff that we talked about on the show, one thing one thing that I sort of want to clarify for me again, like just while I was thinking about stuff this year, is that like although there is a lot of overlap with what I would consider like the best movies and stuff that I watched this year, um, that that's not a hundred percent the case, especially because I wanted to focus more on stuff in the spirit of sparking joy. So uh, I think we both have on our list in general, broadly speaking, quarantine classics, which was one of my favorite parts of the year. Like, you know, not just watching the movies, but doing that on the show. We had a lot of great conversations. I think we really enriched our, like, you know, film backgrounds and ate through that backlog and got got a really nice perspective on things. I mean, I finally watched Citizen fucking Kane. Um, but in particular, though, quarantine classics, even though these were not my two absolute favorite movies out of this i wanted to shout out two in particular because although my favorite that we watched uh of quarantine classics was probably tokyo story tokyo story was also very much like you know as sean said in the episode a stare into the void kind of movie and not, not really in the spirit of this award show uh no, so i wanted to, no. I, <laughs> you know there's we have a bonus episode for that kind of thing um but i in particular i wanted to shout out uh Seven Samurai and Casablanca, which, although not without their own, like, seriousness and, and darkness, Seven Samurai in particular uh, gets gets pretty heavy towards the end. Um, but in general, like, those of quarantine classics, I feel like those were the best, like, crowd pleasers. Like, that, when I was watching those, I felt more like, this is the joy of movies. Like, this is the feeling you're supposed to get when you watch, like, a great blockbuster, like, a big epic. And, like, both of those movies... Um, were excellent 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 movies as well as being just really fun uh timeless sort of crowd pleasers so i want i wanted to zero in on those in particular i i want to echo jackson's sentiment of quarantine classics as a, as a concept i don't have as much that i want to zero in on i just want to say that hey quarantine classics this year was absolutely stellar i i love doing all of them even the ones that i didn't like i feel like i am a better more well-rounded person and film critic for having watched all of them uh so yeah i mean just in general quarantine classics fucking ruled fucking really got me through this year uh because otherwise i don't know i i can't imagine what would have happened if we're just like let's just pick random shit to watch like i feel like we would have hit just a slog because that we did quarantine classics if you include hitchcock month for like three months straight and if we replace those with just 
whatever the fuck we were pulling out of a hat, I feel like I would have just lost my mind. Yeah, that 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 shit would have been miserable. Oh my god. Like trying to stay topical in this like, you know, directly like dump everything you have on the streaming services and hope something sticks. It would have, would have been not the move. <laughs> uh, were you the bum that you missed our episode talking about Artemis Fowl? <laughs> I'm not I would have had nothing to say and I watched that movie. It was bad. <laughs> so instead, we enriched ourselves in our lives. And y'all should, too. Like, I, it, it's hard sometimes to want to go back and watch classic movies. But, like, you're going to be surprised that some of them are just really, really good and not the, the dense, like, horse shit you might expect them to, to be. Jackson is entirely right. Casablanca rules. It is not hard to watch at all. It is just a crowd pleaser. It's great. Go watch Casablanca. Yeah, and I also want to completely echo the sentiment that even though not every movie that I watched is one that I'm going to be thinking about until the end of time or even necessarily liked, they were always interesting conversations and they were definitely enriching. And yeah, 100% hard agree. Quarant- I mean, quarantine classics, like as a concept, is like the the driving thread that got me through 2020 the most. So yeah, no, for sure. Like when I think back on 2020, I'm going to be like, oh, terrible and quarantine classics because that i mean quarantine classics were pretty great like this was probably the defining section of my year because of course it was it was the biggest chunk of my year and it felt the most stable so fuck yeah we we managed to make lemonade out of the sourest moldiest lemons in the world it still turned out great (laughs) it did it really did honestly i think that mold might have added just like a little bit of like hallucinogenic to it and so like it was it was fun y'all we had some great times maybe a little bit of food poisoning but like it was worth it <laughs> the food poisoning came from when we came down from the high and watched Uwe Boll movies <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. I keep forgetting that we came down from quarantine classics in the Ume Bowl. Oh my god. Uh well, you know what? Speaking of food poisoning, I, I wanna give a quick shout out to Fantasy Island. Yeah. <laughs> um just because like of all the movies I saw in theaters this year, uh we're, we're, I wanna kind of gloss over this one fairly quickly because we do have a full episode on it, and it was a, just a great fucking episode. But Fantasy Island was such a goddamn blast to watch. It was utter nonsense garbage dookie schlock in the best possible way and it will live in my heart forever uh it it is the the hunt is the only thing i have that is even remotely comparable to fantasy island this year Uh, i mean sonic the hedgehog came out this year onward came out this year but like those are movies that i forgot i watched half the time but like the hunt and fantasy island fantasy island in particular is a, a, a glowing beacon of a theater experience this year and that is a terrible (laughs) sentence fantasy island is one of those movies i i i think i i said this in the bonus episode but it bears reiterating that fantasy island is a movie that every time i like come across it again like whether i just like see the audio file while i'm like looking through like my documents or just like you know see it on the youtube page of the horse cast page i literally laugh just thinking about it like i can't not think about it fantasy island and not chuckle <laughs> i'm probably gonna have to buy the blu-ray of it i'm not gonna lie i'm I it's probably already like five dollars and i'm going to have to buy the blu-ray of fantasy island because it is that good to watch it is just a great stupid terrible fucking movie if if you've ever wanted to watch michael pena play monokuma by way of hugh hefner do i have a movie for you <laughs> uh jackson hits with another one you got another horse cast related horse cast specific yeah so so this one uh also crossover from our bonus episode here um but so i don't want to reiterate that you know we, 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 that's a bonus episode for a reason this is the primo content but in the spirit of sparking joy few movies that we watched this year for the show spark joy for me in quite the way that kiki's delivery service did. jackson hang on do you have any other um list any other things on the horse cast list just out of curiosity do you have a fourth or is it just these three i do have a fourth okay 
because if it's just these three, we did not talk about this list ahead of time, but we have the exact same list. <laughs> the fact that you have a fourth is what differentiates it. But if you had Kiki, Quarantine, and Fantasy Island, yeah, I mean, our highs were the exact same, my friend. And, and I, th- I think that came across in the episodes, too. Like, I think there there was a lot. Like, if you go back and listen to those episodes, like, Quarantine Classics kind of runs the gamut of, like, you know, more serious, like, analysis and stuff. But it, it, I think with Fantasy Island and Kiki, like, we were just having, like, you know, the time of our lives, like, talking about those movies. Like, we just allowed ourselves to have fun and feel things. That's great. Kiki, honest to God, uh, there were moments there where, like, I was kind of, like, welling up a little bit. But, like... With happiness, and I'm like, oh my god, I remember what joy is. So please, if you need it, watch Kiki's Delivery Service this year, y'all. It is it is genuinely just a wonderful, loving movie that you should absolutely seek out. To the extent that you could call any Miyazaki movie underrated, I, I, I think it's pretty underrated. I think it's genuinely worthy of discussion as like one of the best. Uh, love that movie. So hit us with your with your fourth, because I, I am out. Oh, that's right. Um, So my fourth, actually, uh, the, the reason I put in the rule about, like, stuff that was either new, uh, in the spirit of this being, like, an award show, but I think in that, like, you know, seeing and appreciating something in a new lay, in, uh, in, new lay, ooh, <laughs> in a new way, in a new way, uh, is worthy of discussion on its own. And for that, I want to say I was very pleased watching JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 4, Diamond is unbreakable again. Now, this seems weird because obviously I'm infamous for memeing about JoJo all the time. Uh, But despite the fact that it's kind of one of the fan favorite parts, I did not care for Diamond is Unbreakable so much the first time I watched it. I felt a little bit let down, probably because it got so hyped up in the fandom. Uh, So when I came back to it and like I think especially because its vibe is so chill and like in the spirit of like sparking joy, like that's something that was very valuable this year. In addition to just seeing a lot more of the subtleties and nuances that I missed the first time around, I really, really like my appreciation for the for the part like shot up tremendously um, to the point where I'm like, yeah, it's another like part of JoJo I unambiguously enjoy. And, you know, that's great. That's always a great feeling to like things. <laughs> On the same vein, just worth mentioning because I do not have these on this list, but like I just want to shout out really quick, uh, Uncut Gems, fantastic fucking movie, sparks a lot of joy if you can stomach it, uh, but it is a really tense thriller, so like just be aware of that. It might not be for you, but if you're like, I want to watch a thriller, Uncut Gems is a wild, wild, great ride, um, and I, I do, I just... Speed Racer? Uh, just Speed Racer. I just needed Speed Racer. Speed Racer's a good one. Yeah, no, we, we should totally. Uh, I feel like, that was, you know, I, I, I tend to overlook that because it doesn't fit neatly into, like, quarantine classics or broadly, like, anything else that we were doing. But, yeah, Speed Ra- Racer definitely qualifies in the spirit of, like, sparking joy. This is why I wanted to clarify at the beginning that, like, this isn't necessarily my list of, like, the best movies. Like, Uncut Gems certainly was one of the best movies we talked about on the show, but it was also kind of a tension nightmare. <laughs> so, in the spirit of that i want to focus on like you know the stuff that gave me a very particular joyful feeling of which speed racer definitely qualifies uncut gems brings me a lot of joy for a lot of reasons and it is just a tense nightmare but it genuinely brings me a fuck ton of joy so that is that is fair uh that is completely fair well let's 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 shift gears a little bit and let's talk about some stuff that we didn't talk about for the horse cast and keeping in the the vein of the horse cast though let's talk about movies that we watched this year that we didn't get an opportunity to previously uh you you got anything for us yeah uh so i didn't watch a ton of movies on my own this year um i most of the time when we weren't doing something for the horse cast i was either playing a game for my uh project or watching an anime so i've got a few shows to mention uh however two movies that i wanted to shout out both that i saw in theaters actually uh, after movie theaters opened back up um and you know this was nice i i kind of grouped this in with like quality time with mom category because mom and I ended up going to the theater. It was that irresponsible. I mean, sure. We were also the only two people in the theater because everyone else was scared. So I don't feel that bad about it. Um, But we saw um, a few movies on the big screen. Um, You know, a lot of them, they were just like rerunning classics. Uh, And it was nice to just be in the theater with my mom. Uh, Particularly, we watched Jaws in its own way. That was depressing because it's about 
an incompetent response to it to a to like a crisis affecting a town uh i suspect that's one of the reasons they were running it um <laughs> but uh jaws is still like you know it's the it's the king of the blockbusters for a reason still an excellent excellent movie and uh i also like th- thankfully being the uh nolan fanboy that i am uh, i got to see tenet on the big screen which was really nice like refreshing like break after you know watching so much in the little like tent that's in the garage the infamous gamer hut at this at this point um uh, i got so used to watching movies there and and tenant really was a movie um it definitely didn't approach like the absolute peaks of nolan's career like dark knight or inception uh it it was very much like an interstellar like the narrative was kind of nonsense but the uh, action was spectacular but the action was really spectacular and i had a great time with it so yeah my last movie in theaters was still the hunt i'm so glad my last movie in theaters was uh was not the hunt because unlike sean the hunt brought me no joy but we're not here to discuss that (laughs) i love the hunt still it's a garbage movie but it was so much fun to watch uh i did not see either of these movies in theaters and indeed one of these movies is not even uh a 2020 release but fuck it i still saw it in 2020 and absolutely adored it uh so first and foremost palm springs a great movie you might have heard about those time loop things go fucking watch palm springs uh it it basically is like you know what we're doing here you understand time loops let's not fucking delve into that and let's just do it baby uh and it's it's a really really great funny heartfelt interesting movie uh i absolutely adored it and i've been thinking about it ever since uh so palm springs great movie 100 percent go watch it it's on hulu great uh the one that probably did more for my year on the whole, uh, I hit a point where I was kind of just in a slump. And th- I, this might have actually been last year. I don't remember anymore. Time has blended together <laughs> in so many ways. But fuck it. I'm going to talk about it anyway. So I, I hit this just like really rough slump of like, I don't know. Movies aren't really doing anything for me. Like what? Why am I watching movies? What? What's? Wh- where am I at with anything right now? Um, and then Sam and I sat down and watched a movie called Ready or Not. Uh, and it was exactly what I needed. It is a weird horror movie based on hide and seek, essentially. <laughs> um, but it knows exactly what it's doing. It has a ton of fun with it. Uh, and there's a scene where you immediately understand what's going to happen and you cringe through your fucking skull watching it happen. It's not even like a horrible death scene or anything. It's just really grody body horror, uh, and is just so, so fucking good. Ready or not is genuinely one of the best movies I've seen in years just because of how much it brought energy back to me, back to my movie going experience and remind me that movies can just be a shit ton of fun. Uh, so hard, 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 hard recommendation for ready or not. If you're looking for something kind of like a horror comedy, it's great. It's stellar. It's a lot of fun. Go watch it. Hell yeah. That's that's the exact kind of energy we're looking to have uh, on this this here award show. Um, you know, we don't need no we don't need no classics. We just need a grand old time. Fuck yeah. Let's talk some TV shows and you, you let's, let's switch back to the, the back and forth. You know, I feel like I've got three. I assume you've got a couple more than me. I've got I've got like four. So why, why don't I uh, should I start off? Should I? Yeah, end yeah. It? you I, can start. We can bounce back and forth. It'll time out nicely. Sure. So um, most of the TV shows I watch were. were fucking anime because of course they were (laughs) obviously there's one show that i watched that wasn't anime um and i'm gonna mention it first in in the uh spirit of nice things that i i did with my mom quality time with the family because we did watch it uh we started it on her birthday and that was the mandalorian which was very much a pleasant surprise i've been an enormous critic of basically every disney star wars thing so I was a little suspect, like, seeing all the Baby Yoda memes and thought maybe it'd just be, like, a like a cheap little show that, like, eh, whatever, like, you know, they're they're cloying and, like, cashing in. Uh, no, it's actually pretty, pretty great, pretty good. Not, like, you know, the most amazing thing I've ever seen, um, but 
Uh, it was a lot of fun. Both seasons had a lot of great individual episodes. Really, like, classic TV. Like, it wasn't so much focused about, like, the the broader episodes and focused, like, the broader story arcs and fo- focused more on delivering, like, interesting, shorter, little, like, traditional TV episodes, which was kind of refreshing. Um, I really like the... Uh, you know, that they go back to more of the Western elements of Star Wars that, that I feel like have been getting more and more ignored as like the lore kind of collapses in on itself. Uh, and yeah, it's just a simple story told well with, with exciting action and highlighting a part of Star Wars that has been sort of neglected recently. Uh, and, I, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So um, I want to talk about the Mandalorian. <laughs> <laughs> Well, go uh, for it. What do you got to say, Ashley? What do you have to add? Uh, honestly, nothing at this point. Um, Jackson <laughs> has pretty much said everything. Uh, I have only seen season one at this point. Um, but I I was actually even more uh, leery of it, I think, than Jackson was, which is kind of a surprise, given that Jackson tends to be uh, a stronger opinion, stronger, stronger opi- words, words are hard, uh, more strongly <laughs> opinionated about Star Wars than I am. In, in general, there are some differences, like Rise of Skywalker makes me mad just saying the name. <laughs> Um, Me- meanwhile, I'm like, ha Palpatine spirit bomb, funny. <laughs> oh, boy, 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 boy. Uh, but I refused to watch The Mandalorian for so long because I'm like, Baby Yoda looks like the most grating, annoying thing I have ever seen in television in the history of anything. Uh, and then I had a friend who watched The Mandalorian, uh, and you can, th- they have their own podcast, Discontent. You can go listen to them talk about it please do uh but they did not give a shit about star wars and they watched the mandalorian i don't really know why uh and they've slowly just started like wait this is good this is good and now they are just like die hard extended lore star wars fans like they are fucking in deep uh and so i'm like okay there has to be something to this Mandalorian show. What the fuck is up with it? Like, how did this person who, like, I, this is not to say, like, they are, they are a person who would just, like, wantonly get into things. Like, I respect their opinion. They have some taste when it comes to things. Uh, so, like, <laughs> I, you know, th- there must be something there. And I sat down uh, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to watch the first episode. And I did. And I'm like, okay, that was better than I was expecting. I don't know how I'm feeling about it yet. And, like, I put on the second one. I'm like, okay, I'm starting to get it. And then, like, episode three Ah, uh, the the baby Yoda did a thing, and I laughed at it and went, "Oh no, oh no, I understand it, <laughs> I get it now." Uh, and then like, yeah, I, I ended up really, really fucking liking the season one of The Mandalorian. I haven't started season two yet, uh, mostly because I'm very worried about how it ends. Uh, just given my appreciation for the Last Jedi, um, and I do know how it ends. I've seen spoilers on Twitter, so I'm kind of waiting to dig into it uh but i yeah i I really like season one as jackson said it does go back to its western roots which i really really appreciate and love quite a bit so fuck yeah mandalorian season one absolutely rules i'm sure season two is also pretty good again haven't started it uh for, for what it's worth i don't think anything about the ending of season two really like ruins anything about about the last jedi or goes out of its way to like un- undo things it's a little well, fan servicey but the, but the whole show is kind of fan servicey so i think it's fine see that, that's the thing that i'm kind of just to, for a, a detour down mandalorian route uh season one uh, the reason i really like season one is that it didn't feel fan servicey uh like season one felt like very much something that you would just read in a Star Wars extended universe book. Like, just like, hey, I want to flesh out this era of the lore. Oh, that's that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Season two is definitely heavier on the fan service stuff. And that's what I really liked about season one. And that's why I'm kind of leery of season two in general. Uh, and like, I don't necessarily I- intend to say like, oh, the ending of season two undoes anything in The Last Jedi. But like, it kind of feels thematically at odds with the last Jedi, like with what the last Jedi is trying to say and what happens in it. Um, because other people are out there. Let's just put it that way. Um, and so we get the fan service stuff and that's, it's fine. I'm sure it's going to be fine. It's not going to like send me into a rage or anything like that, but it's just one of those things like there's, there's other people, man, you know, it's, it's a big galaxy. (laughs) 
Yeah, for for what it's worth, I I, I do think that season one was stronger, um, especially although weirdly enough, not because of fan service reasons. There's like one episode of season two that's like a complete waste of time. That's just like Mando fighting a bunch of giant spires, and it's like the most boring, pointless thing I've ever seen in my Ugh. entire life. Uh, but like uh, once once it gets going, like uh, yeah, some some of the fan service is a little grating, but overall, I still enjoyed it. So eh, thank thank it as you will. <laughs> Talk about another show, Jackson. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and kind of wrap two into one uh you know to make to, to make this go a little bit quicker because they fall under the same category and i think i technically started one of them in 2019 um but didn't finish it until this year so uh i've i've been you know i'm i'm a weeb but no. I'm, I'm kind of a, no no but like no but surprising what's surprising to people is that i mentioned that i'm kind of a late bloomer weeb um i i uh you know recently when we were playing D and D, which I mean is also one of the best things about this year is our D and D sessions, but that's not really a media thing. I guess. Oh, it it's on is. my list anyway. Honestly, spoilers. Oh, well, <laughs> well, then perfect. We can talk about it then. But um, during one of those D and D sessions, uh, Sam had rightfully called me out by saying that like my taste and worldview is basically identical to hers at thirteen, which was, I mean, you know, that's that's a pretty embarrassing thing, but it's true. So. <laughs> <laughs> In that spirit of edgy weeaboo uh, 13 year olds, I watched uh, two classic animes that are like kind of in the in the weeb canon at this point that I had not seen. Uh, the first was Full Metal Alchemist 2003. Uh, I was told that I should watch both. And if I was going to watch both it and Brotherhood, I should start with 2003 because it's easier to appreciate 2003 and then go to Brotherhood than the other way around. Uh, so I haven't watched Brotherhood yet, uh, which most most people say is better. But I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed 2003 a whole lot. Uh, Brotherhood it, it, whips ass just as, to cut you off really quick. Brotherhood whips yeah. fucking ass and like is a anime that stands past being like, ooh, I'm an edgy 13 year old. It gets into like fucking themes, y'all. No, and 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 um, 2003 does too, uh, and like that's one of the things I really appreciate about it, and that like it almost, I almost was like not sure whether to bring it up in that context because it is pretty heavy um but it's also fun it's also still like a shonen at the end of the day so it, it strikes a nice balance with its tone of like occasionally existentially horrifying and then having like you know some cool action scenes and stuff so that's a great show uh and you know more to the point of like edgy 13 year old anime fan because yeah you're right that like you know even like you know can't speak for brotherhood i'm sure it's quite the same totally but like you know 2003 is definitely not just a you know edgy like otaku like weeb boy thing um what's more along those lines but i still love to death and enjoyed every second of anyway and do feel like fit more into like the pure joy spirit of things uh, was i finally watched death note and death note was a fucking blast <laughs> um it's edgy it's over the top it's silly but it's also like one of the like it, it, it's such a it's such a page turner like you know it's it, it, it you just can't put it down you want to see what the next scheme is you like you want to like you revel in those like long monologues with like the over dramatic music about you know how like l and light are going to like outplay each other um shit spectacular uh if, if you, uh, you know full metal alchemist has a lot of deep themes and it's not that like death note is brainless or anything like that but it, it's much more in the spirit of like just pure I was going to say, like, pure good fun. Like, it's very dark. It is, like, dark tonally. It definitely has that, like, 13-year-old edgy weave aesthetic. But, like, it doesn't, like, revel in it. It's, it's you know, it, 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 it kind of like Uncut Gems. It's just a really solid thriller for the most part. It's it's also just really fucking camp in a lot of ways. And, like, yeah, not, yes. not in the conventional way. Like, when you think of camp and you think of, like, airplane or something, it's, like, a really dark and edgy and, like, you know, a page turning thriller, but like the, it, it still manages to just ooze campy nonsense. It's a, it's a nonsense anime in a lot of ways, but it's great. I love death note. I, I still love death note. So I, I think like the highest compliment I can give it. And like, I'm not the first person to make this observation. I probably stole this from like a YouTube video. Sorry. I can't give credit, but um, one of the coolest things about like the anime at least is how like a lot of the show is just some like, you know, twerpy high schooler writing in a book and yet like, you know, with that campy element, with the direction, like with the style that it oozes, 
is it manages to make that feel like as much of a pulse pounding thriller like as anything else and that's really impressive it takes itself serious and that's important but like it also knows what it's doing and so it manages to ride the line that we talk about all the time where like you can't take yourself too serious because otherwise you'll you know come across like i don't know fucking tommy wiseau or something (laughs) uh but you also can't take yourself too lightly because then you come across as like a velocipaster and velocipaster is not a great reference point but you get what i'm going for thanks killing thanks killing (laughs) thanks killing yeah thanks killing is a a better reference point um so yeah no death note's great highly recommended um i'm gonna just say this really stupid fucking quick Hey, Avatar The Last Airbender is great. You should watch it. I never finished it as a kid. Finished it this year. Still very, very good. It's all I got. I'm not going to talk about Avatar. Everyone knows Avatar The Last Airbender is great. You all know it. I watched it last uh, last year or like two years ago or something like that. Uh, I had never watched it as a kid for some re- again. Like I was I was a late bloomer weeb, and I, the weeb aesthetic actually kind of turned me off a little bit when I was a child. Um, but like Avatar is absolutely like the best Western cartoon ever made. <laughs> I think I think it's it's a strong candidate for that title. <laughs> uh, the Kyoshi books on on a similar vein are very very good. So if you're looking for something more to read about Avatar, the Kyoshi books are great. Jackson, give us another one because. I actually realize I have a fourth as well, so. Sure, great. Um, I'm actually going to save one of these shows uh, because I want to shout it out in in a special place. Um, Although, ooh, because I actually just remembered that, like, because I didn't start watching this show, but I did watch, like, the most recent season of it. Um, So it's worth mentioning here. I mean, this is probably actually the best thing I watched all year. Uh, But I also, I associate this more heavily in a different context. Um... Season five of Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul is fucking amazing. Um, if you're a Breaking Bad fan and you just haven't watched it, assuming that like a prequel about Saul Goodman of all things can be not be good. Better Call Saul is incredible. De- debatably better than Breaking Bad, I think. It's debate like Jimmy is debatably more of a complex character than Walter White and like the relationships and the way that stuff plays out. It does have some cringe Star Wars prequel things, but like they're normally not too overbearing. Uh and like, you know, the just like the absolute like mastery on display is worth that 100%. Uh yeah, but this is the only real like like live action like you know western show that i watched all year but it's it's one of my absolute favorites i've heard it's actually pretty watchable even if you haven't seen uh that better call Saul the other one it break, it, breaking breaking bad, bad. No, I, wow I, i'd agree i i don't know it, that's harder for me to say because i hadn't thought about it from that perspective um i mean i i, I highly recommend both but <laughs> I, i'm more interested in watching better call Saul uh because i really really like bob odenkirk and like i have nothing against brian cranston uh but he is forever hal for malcolm in the middle for me uh and i don't know that i better call saul feels more my speed i think is what it boils down to it looks a little bit more kind of procedurally in a lot of ways and that kind of interests me and like lawyer shows kind of interest me in ways that uh drug shows don't as much so i'm 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 pretty interested in better call saul more so than breaking bad so i might try it and i'll let you know well, you you absolutely should. I can't argue. Like like I said, the, these are two of my favorite shows of all time. Uh, so like anyone watching Better Call Saul for any reason is a good thing. <laughs> so on a flip side, what we do in the shadows uh, is such a great television show. Uh, if you haven't watched Taika Waititi's movie, What We Do in the Shadows, you absolutely should. Uh, but the show somehow takes it and makes it just even better uh what we do in the shadows is 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 stellar it's this like almost pseudo documentary thing going on uh where it's just following vampires throughout their lives in new jersey and it is boring and weird and wild and um fucking matt berry is in it and like if you put Matt Berry in anything, it is it is great. And Sam and I walk around going Jesk all the time and <laughs> Jackie Daytona all the time. It is it is a wonderful, wonderful show. Uh, it is very dry and weird and like it, it's hard to really explain, but you should watch it for every you should watch it i mean i'm sorry i know i just keep saying you should watch it but like when i'm trying to just get through these really quickly 
that's all I got to say. You should watch <laughs> What We Do in the Shadows. Uh, it's it's funny. It's hilarious. It's weird. It's strange. I just keep listing similes now. So, <laughs> or synonyms. I can't talk anymore either. I'm going to go put my head in the toilet. Jackson, talk about another show. <laughs> Well, that's that's all I've got for shows, actually. I could mention, because um, I only have one thing for, for books that I want to shout out. I didn't read too many books this year, like an illiterate, but... <laughs> well, why don't you talk about your book then really quick, and I'll wrap up with shows so we can kind of, like, move on to the next step together. Sounds great. Um, So, yeah, and it's kind of related to shows, because I started reading these books because we did talk about The Witcher Show in one of our bonus episodes. Um, Now, I didn't especially love The Witcher Show. I thought it was all right, uh, but it did like kind of boot me in the ass to actually start reading some of the books. I haven't read all of them, uh, but particularly uh, the first short story collection and the first novel is, is really great. Um, And uh, I, I enjoyed them thoroughly there. I think tonally they have a a, a better grasp on, on on, like on the material than the show did. The show maybe took itself a little too seriously at parts. Um, The, the books feel more pulpy, uh, the characters are pretty broad. It's it's still it feels very much like Witcher Three, the game, and that's high praise from. I was about to say high praise for CD Projekt Red, but I don't know if they deserve that these days. <laughs> <laughs> they shut themselves in the foot this year really badly. <laughs> um, but it's it's high praise for like you know circa like 2014 CD Projekt Red that they were able to uh, translate the essence of those books. Um, if you are if you enjoyed the show uh, of The Witcher show, if you enjoyed the games. Uh, highly recommend that as a series. Well, I'm also going to talk about something related to a, a thing that we did on the on the podcast, uh, which is Hannibal. Hell yeah! The best. I saw somebody tweet about this, and like I didn't even process how weird it was until I saw this. But I'm basically just going to run with this tweet in which they talk about how in se- in episode eight of season one, this is a three season show. In episode eight of season one. Uh, a, a character gets murdered and then has his uh, like neck split open and his like tendons dried so that somebody could play him like a violin, um, which they described as that's the type of thing that you do on like season 26 of a show where nobody is paying attention to anymore <laughs> because that is some space brain wild ass murder shit going on there. And that's episode eight. Eight of season one, god damn it. Uh, so this show is right off the bat, just like full force, just wild and out. Uh, and it is it is great for it. Uh, it, it gave me a, a deep, deep appreciation for Mads Mickelson, who is turns out is also just a wild fucking dude, and I kind of love him <laughs> now. Uh, and just in general, it's it's a really, really great show. It's not long, as I said, three seasons. Um People are clamoring for a fourth season, and just I want to come on the record right now and say you're wrong. Season three ended perfectly for the series. We don't need a fourth season. It's over. Let it go. Uh, So, yeah, watch Hannibal. It's on Netflix. It won't take you that long. It's wild, and I had a great time with it. My my man drawing a line in the sand for solid conclusions. We stand a king. (laughs) Sometimes you just got to end things. It's great. It ended well. I agree. Uh, all right, let's shift gears once again, and let's talk about, our, I assume, our, our biggest element here. Let's let's try and keep it moving. We're, we're already at 45 minutes. We, we, this episode's going to run long no matter what, but, you know, let's fucking chug along. Let's talk about some video games here. Hell yeah. Uh, you know, I, I started off the last one. Do you want to start off this one? Sure. Uh, I kind of went on a, on a tear this year of like classic FPS maze style games. Uh, And I think that a big chunk of that is because of a game called Post Void. Uh, It's like $3 on Steam and I cannot recommend picking it up enough. It is like kind of a Twitch FPS, but it's a Twitch FPS through the lens of like those old Microsoft Windows screensavers where you're walking through a maze. But also it's like, Lovecraftian body horror and just noise punk and just 
so much happens in it. And it, it. It's very short. Like, it's not a long game, and I probably haven't put that much time into it, but it is a game that has not left my mind just because of how good it feels to play. The soundtrack just drives you along. It's it's a roguelike, I guess it's worth mentioning, uh, but, like, it is a roguelike in the... The runs are three minutes long, not 45 minutes long. Cannot recommend it enough. Post Void fucking slaps. Hell yeah. So so to get through my list a little quicker, I guess I'll, I'll go with broad categories. Um, and first, uh, I played quite a few games, uh, three games in particular that I received for Christmas last year and put a lot of time into at the beginning of 2020. And those would be The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening Remake, Luigi's Mansion 3, and Dragon Quest XI Echoes of a whatever. <laughs> Dragon Quest XI um, S Special Edition Echoes of an Elusive Age <laughs> Definitive Edition. I don't know what's so hard to get about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just just to run through these because I haven't actually finished Dragon Quest yet. Uh, that's that's not the, that's not the game that I want to binge. And I've been doing other RPGs for my project, so it's been kind of on the back burner. But it's in terms of pure joy, uh, you can't go wrong with Dragon Quest. It's like if, if you're into JRPGs at all, it's kind of weird. It's kind of unsettling if you've never played a dragon quest game like hearing about how they're so legendary in japan and kind of playing it and being like this is it seriously because it's very simple but there's there's purity and beauty in that simplicity uh so if if you're at all a fan of uh you know rpgs even just like akira toriyama's art style you know there's there's a lot of charm let me just say this as someone who is not a huge fan of jrpgs i've played a chunk of dragon quest eight i think on the 3ds it's charming there's it, as jackson said there's not a lot to it but like i put some time into it because i'm like fuck it i want to play a jrpg and dragon quest scratches an itch it is charming and if you're jackson's right if you like jrpgs you should play dragon quest i definitely said dragon quest and not dragon age dragon quest yeah and then for the for the other two uh to you know keep it moving along uh luigi's mansion three uh you know very 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 charming game as well um, you know, lots of solid puzzles that, uh, you know, they're, they're involved, but you're not going to be like, you know, banging your head against the wall, uh, has some of like the most delightful animations I've seen in a game. Like this is what I would want, like a Mario movie to look like. Um, and yeah, just, just a really great, uh, I'd played the original, Lu the original Luigi's Mansion and enjoyed it. Like it had its own charms as like a weird sort of quirky relic. Uh, but this was, um, this was this was next level in comparison, and it was made by Next Level Games. Haha. -ha. <laughs> uh, I will also echo this. I did not play it this year, which is why it's not on my list. But Sam and I played Luigi's Mansion uh, last year. I was Gooigi the entire time, which I am just proud to say that I was Gooigi, <laughs> uh, and it was great. Luigi's Mansion Three is a lot of fun. It's not like the most complex game in the world, but there's it. Jackson said there's a lot of charm to it. The puzzles are really interesting in a lot of places, and it is just beautiful to walk through highly recommended as well uh and so for my last game which uh honestly was so fucking good that uh it, it would have been under consideration for my best games of all time project but i had i had to cut it off somewhere um and i played it too late uh so the Link's awakening remake um it, hot take maybe Link's Awakening blows Link to the Past out of the water. It's such a startlingly like creative and wonderful Zelda game. It reminds me why I like Zelda in the first place after having my uh, appreciation for the series beaten down over the years and then restored with Breath of the Wild. But like, you know, that's sort of different. Uh, so it's sort of like, ah, whatever. Like, you know, they had to change so much. Uh, no, like Link's Awakening was still a delight to go back to. Lots of... Um, like a lot of what I appreciate about my favorite Zelda games, kind of the narrative subtlety, the quirky worlds. Um, like it really started with that game and, and not so much Link to the Past, uh, which established a lot of the like mechanical conventions and was an important game. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but for my money, like, you know, that's that's the one. That's it, Chief. One of my one of my favorite Zelda games, period. Uh, I will also echo that because <laughs> I really like that game, too. Again, I played it last year, so it does not make the horses this year. But Link's Awakening is a great game, and I like the original quite a bit as well. Uh, I am going to use this as an opportunity to talk about the fact that Oracle of Seasons is the best Legend of Zelda game, at least 2D-wise, and you should play that, uh, especially you, Jackson, because I think you'll like it. Oracle of Seasons fucking rules. I, uh, I should play that, yeah, for sure. It's, it's on my list. It's on my backlog. <laughs> 
But Link's Awakening is just like a really tight game. It, 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 I agree that uh, the Link to the Past is almost kind of bloated in places. It's really good and it's a lot of fun, but like it, it can get long in the tooth. Whereas Link's Awakening just like boom, 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 boom. You're done. Get out of here and is great for it. Hard agree. Hard agree. So on what, what, what else did you play this year? So I, I'm going to continue down this path of like first person maze games uh, and say that I am on a weird hardcore Doom kick. Uh, and I'm not talking Doom Eternal. I'm not talking Doom 2016. I'm talking Doom 1993. My uh, man. Yeah, I, I got really into Doom 1993 and played a shit ton of that until I eventually just kind of went, all right, I think I've seen what it had to do, and I was getting frustrated in a level, uh, and fell off it, and then Doom 64 went on sale like a couple months back. I picked that up and played a shit ton of Doom 64, which also fucking rules, and I'm now reading a book about John Carmack and John Romero and id and the development of Doom and how they got to where they are. Uh, so, like, I'm on a hardcore Doom kick right now. Uh, and the, the classic Doom games fucking rule uh they are perfectly made for the nintendo switch in a lot of ways uh i tried playing them on computer on pc a ways back and they just i bounced off them really hard uh but if you're playing it on something where you can do like a twin stick shooter uh it, they're great they don't work as well on like mouse and keyboard uh but like when you're just left right perfect games absolutely stellar they feel great on the switch absolutely pick them up uh and they hold up like i was expecting to appreciate them for like what they did for video games and designs and levels and stuff uh and i do but they're also just really fun good games and i have just had a great time playing them especially i haven't played doom 2 uh, i clearly have not played doom 3 because i've heard that's bad but i want to play doom 3 anyway <laughs> uh so yeah doom and doom 64 absolutely great and if you're looking masters of doom Great book. Haven't finished it, but it's really interesting. So there's my book tie-in. <laughs> I also want to echo Doom. I've been playing it because uh, it was on sale for like 30 cents or whatever on the eShop. Um, so I had played uh, the original Doom to completion back in the Xbox Live Arcade days. Uh, quite enjoyed it. Still quite enjoy it now. Still a great, wonderful game that I've been picking up off and on. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll hard agree on that. Give us the next one. So the next one, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, um, I did a lot of deep dives this year where even if it wasn't for my project, I went and replayed like entire series or close to entire series. I actually wanted to prepare for Death Stranding uh, because I still haven't played that, but I wanted to play all of the other games that Hideo Kojima has made as like a big Metal Fear, Metal Fear, <laughs> Metal Gear fan. Um, did you play the, the Sun Warrior or whatever? Did you, did you imagine no. you how to play that? No, I, I I got sort of burnt out. I, I like I I know we're supposed to be positive, um, but you know my one negative hot take. I'm just gonna drop and run. I got really burnt out after finishing Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker after playing all the other ones because that game's exhausting and pretty bad. Uh, I didn't even go on to five after that. So I I technically got all. I played every Metal Gear like canon Metal Gear game except for five. Uh, did and you play Metal Gear Acid? Metal Gear I Acid Two. Kojima didn't it wasn't involved in those so I they, know, didn't. they have their own <laughs> canon I was reading about them the other day actually <laughs> I do I do want to play them though um so one thing I want to shout out uh I, I again I got burnt out so I didn't end up playing all the other like snatcher and police knots and all the other like you know non-metal gear games he made that I want to play um but I did for the first time play uh metal gear and Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, the 8-bit MSX games, uh, and although they obviously uh, don't compare to the Solid games as, like, you know, technical and artistic achievements, uh, still really, really interesting, fun, solid, if dated, like, 8-bit games to go back to, particularly the second one. The second one's really impressive uh, at, for how, like, fully featured it is for, like, what's basically an NES game. I know the MSX wasn't the NES, but, like, you know, we're around that caliber. Um... And so that was pleasant surprise. I'm glad, like, will I ever play Metal Gear 1 again? Probably not, but I'm glad that I did. I might go back to the second one because it's got a real cool, like, vibe and soundtrack. Um, I have and a then buddy actually playing the those games right now. Uh, he played Death Stranding and came off and, like, I want to play more Hideo Kojima games. And he got into Metal Gear Solid 5. Uh, and I'm, I'm very excited because he's starting off at five and kind of go working. Like, I'm like, you have to go back and play one and two. Like, I know those are the big ones, uh, but he's like, I want to go back and play metal gear one and two before I even get into solid. I'm like, all right, Hey, knock your fucking self out. 
My uh, so man. I'm, I'm very curious to see where he ends up on it. Like, he really likes uh, Kojima's nonsense. So I, It's a very particular brand of nonsense that I, too, appreciate, obviously. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and, and I guess while we're still here, this technically didn't fall under the category of a Kojima game, but I was curious to go back to it. Um, and in the spirit of games, I had a reevaluation of. I'm, I'm, I'm more attuned to action games, so I went and I replayed Metal Gear Rising, and uh, it's not like a perfect game. I wouldn't even say it's an amazing game, but it's a grand old time, and it's got a god tier meme final boss that's still fucking hilarious. <laughs> Nano Machine Sun. Nano Machine Sun. So that was my Metal Gear deep dive. Obviously, all the other ones I had played before, and probably have things to say about them at various points. Peace Walker sucks. <laughs> I'm going to slap two games together and I'm going to call them my busy work games. Uh, one of which should be very obvious from that title, uh, <laughs> but the other one might be a little bit less so. And I'm going to start with that one, uh, which is to say Pokemon Shield, actually. Uh, mm. I got really into Pokemon Shield, not because it's a great game, uh, but because Sam and I, A, I got into uh, hatching eggs to try, like, Masuda method shiny farming, uh, and I did manage to walk away with two shinies, which is great. I got my shiny Gumi, uh, and I got my shiny Haunted Anchor, which I have already forgotten the name of that Pokemon, but I think it's, <laughs> it's great. Uh, so, like, I'm really proud that I did that, but I also finished my pokedex like of the main game as well as both dlcs uh and sam did as well uh and like that was just a a, a grand time i don't think that the the sword and shield are great games i think that they are fine uh but it's for something to do while you're just kind of trapped in quarantine finally getting a chance to finish a pokedex in a pokemon game was really satisfying and a really kind of cool thing to do for the first time ever so here i am with an officially completed pokemon game i have done it all so that's kind of a, a proud thing there and it was just it was, it was a fun time it was not as heavy of a load as i thought it was going to be so pokemon shield kind of a great time for me this year hell yeah that's great i i really got to finish a pokedex in one of the games these days i'd probably want to go for um like red and blue uh just just for the you know because i'm a pretentious hipster uh but like yeah that's a, that sounds like a like a perfect like time waster game as you say <laughs> It really was. No, it was, it was great for that. Uh, and the other one I do have to talk about is Animal Crossing New Horizon. There it uh, is. Yeah, there was no way I wasn't going to be talking about it in some capacity. Mostly because more than anything, it's just been stability for me. Uh, like, I, if you if you followed along with the podcast, you know I had a job, that I didn't have a job, uh, and that I got a job recently. I don't think I've even mentioned that on the podcast, but I'm, I'm employed again. Hooray! Yay! Uh, <laughs> but, like, when you have no job and you're just kind of, you know, every day is bleeding together and you're doing freelance work and you're kind of just working through life, trying to figure out what you're doing and like where you fit in and what you're working on um, can be really daunting. And so just having something to clock into every day and be like, all right, I'm going to spend half an hour on Animal Crossing and like I need to knock out these chores. Like they are chores. There's not a better word for it, but it is <laughs> really it's it's just nice. It's satisfying and it, it it's comforting in a way that not much else in 2020 was. And so I have played this game literally every day since it has come out. I have not missed a day. And I I, I mean, am I kind of burnt out on it? Yeah. Am I still gonna check in on it tomorrow? Yeah, <laughs> uh, just because like there's some stability to it. Like I've had villagers like in, over the past couple months, especially where they're like, I want to move out. And I'm just like, listen, I and I know Jackson likes the, the fact that villagers pop in and out. And I, I think that there is something to that. But right now, when all I really need is just stability, like I'm, I'm so thrilled that I can be like, listen, I I cannot deal with you moving out right now i like that i come into this and every day it's the exact same thing and it's it, it I, it's in my control and i don't have to worry about it so shout outs to animal crossing new horizon for if nothing else being stable and when it released it was a ton of fun to play with other people like i had a bunch of friends playing it together i had friends who picked it up because of my review which felt weird uh that rules so, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that that's awesome <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I did. My mom wanted to pick it up because of my review. She picked up Pocket Camp, and I'm like, oh, that's a that's the wrong game to pick up. Pocket Camp is bad, <laughs> but she doesn't have a Switch. So like, I actually, like, I, I think I did a good job of explaining it back then why people play Animal Crossing, just because it is such a, an easy game to play, and it just feels nice to pick it up every day and just do some chores and put it down. Uh, so, yeah, Animal Crossing New Horizon is a great stability game in this year, and it, Pick it up. You might like it. I know I do a bad job of making it sound fun, and it's hard to even explain what the fun of Animal Crossing is, but you'll know it if you play it, I guess. I mean, that, that really is how it is. Like, Animal Crossing Forever. Like, I remember even back in the day when I played the GameCube game as a kid, and, like, my parents would ask me, like, so what are you doing in this game? I'm like, oh, you know, you, you buy a house and, like, you know, plant trees. And they're like, why, what is wrong with you? Like, if you want to plant trees so much, like, you know, I got a garden. You can tend to, you little shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's so hard to explain. It's just, it's just a very simple zen game, and there's not, like, a lost state to it, so you don't have to worry about anything like that. It, it, it's just, it's just nice and i think that's really what matters sometimes is it's just nice it is just nice yeah i I, i'm i think i'm one of the only people i know that didn't play animal crossing although that was less for like any like grand reason and more that i just played a shit ton of new leaf earlier and kind of burnt myself out on it (laughs) but yeah um, i actually i had a time waster game too it was a different game uh but but served a similar purpose um so i'd played this game on the wii u back when it came out basically just cleared the campaign and was like that was enjoyable and then didn't think about it much after that uh but i had a weird hankering to pick it up and i still have my wii u uh but i was like well like you know they've added so much to this game and like i I, you know i've got some for for once i'm like you know mooching off the government i've got some unemployment money fuck it let's just buy it for the switch uh that would be hyrule warriors definitive edition Mm. um with all the dlcs and you know talk about like you know the perfect time waster game uh like there's just enough depth to the gameplay like on a on a like a real-time strategy sort of level that like you know you're not completely checked out but for the most part you're just like mowing down legions and legions of guys uh, and then funnily enough after i completed the full campaign plus like the wind waker chapters in this one it was just kind of burning through the adventure maps of which there are a lot that i still haven't completed <laughs> to be clear i have friends who have 100 percent of this game and it took them like 500 some hours to do so it is a big game they are they are madmen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Although, like, I can see myself doing it over like a long period of time, but um, I'm also playing Age of Calamity right now, which uh, I'm I, I guess is an honorable mention here because I'm also having a great time with it. Uh, and funny, uh, funnily enough, like after I had finished it, they had announced Age of Calamity, so I'm like, huh, well, you know, it's just the the good times keep on coming, and 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 you know what? And also the spirit of Link's Awakening, it was nice to like, um, it. It is a fan service game, and although like I do turn my nose up at all like the Skyward Sword shit in that game, there's a lot of other stuff in, especially in the definitive edition with all the DLC characters. Just like man, like I love Zelda, dude. Like I, it's it's nice to love things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm playing Age of Calamity, and I really like Age of Calamity. Uh, I, I think I'm too fresh on it to really have a hot opinion of it. I haven't finished the story yet, and I kind of want to get through that first because I I hit. If you've played it, I've hit a turning point, um, and you probably know what I'm referring to by that. There's one big moment that kind of changes things, uh, so let's leave it at that, because I don't want to spoil it for Jackson. Yeah, um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty early on still. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm not sure how I feel about that yet, and I'm kind of waiting to see where the story goes from here. Uh, so I don't know how I feel about it, but I do agree that uh, Musou games in general have been a lot of fun, mostly from my experience with uh age of calamity which has been absolutely great i'm gonna transition from that into games that let me continue to talk to my friends uh which i just want to shout out two of them really quick uh one of which is fall guys which was great and a lot of fun and Mm, i fell off of it but it was a lot of fun to play with jackson and some friends from high school uh we would just sit down and shoot the shit and play fall guys and have a great time and of the same vein legend of zelda ocarina of time randomizer Great fucking time, great way to play Ocarina of Time, a game that I don't really like that much, and I'm sorry to everyone, please don't end me, Um, but (laughs) Ocarina of Time Randomizer is a fantastic way to play, and I had a great time with it. As someone who was involved in both of these, uh, yeah, like, it's funny, I I, didn't uh, think to add these, although as far as, like, you know, stuff 
in 2020 that was like not miserable um yeah like that that was an excellent time i got to hang out with sean i got to know his uh his his, his pals pretty well like you know i kind of knew before but like you know ha- was having a wonderful time with and you know friendship friendship is great isn't it <laughs> <laughs> uh so yeah hard agree on both of those well i got one left jackson you got any left oh yeah so i got one more i've got one more uh and i i guess i'll just finish off with uh because i did a mario deep dive as well uh because they you know had the collection and they um i didn't really intend to do a deep dive at first because they just dropped the uh original all-stars collection on switch online and so i just sort of went through it and then i paused after playing all the games of that collection i'm like well i may as well do the rest of them because <laughs> um, i because i knew i was gonna buy the the 3d all-stars collection so i did a mario deep dive which was a ton of fun um I'm going to shout out three games here as part of that. Uh, The first are two of the only like main series games that I had not played. And that is Super Mario Land and Super Mario Land 2. Six golden coins. Really underrated little gems. Uh, I I forgot, you know, New Super Mario Bros. had so worn me down on the concept of 2D Mario that like it's easy to forget that like it doesn't have to all be the same like bland generic garbage like those are really creative really memorable games that if you haven't tried they're not long and they're both on the 3DS eShop uh and so you you should go through them they have some of the most like imaginative creative stuff I've seen in any Mario game and you know they are original Game Boy games and they're so they're a little like rough around the edges uh but you know if you if you go in expecting that like man nintendo was doing some weirdo shit on the game boy back in the day i miss that (laughs) um so that was great um so i had never played those games before to completion uh but i replayed actually and i wanted to mention this last one because one of my hotter takes before was that mario galaxy one was not good actually (laughs) um and i i hadn't played it since i was a teenager when i was really excited for it um and initially loved it when it came out and then slowly like sort of uh dampened on over time uh, and and a lot of that was just because like the level design is simpler like there it's it's more flash than like you know depth of mechanics like something like mario 64 or even sunshine um and like i started to sour on those things but it's just funny how like priority change and like the more i went on in mario galaxy one and i do think the game makes a bad first impression actually but like as you go on you like unlock the stuff in the storybook and you just sort of like take in the atmosphere it's a really marvelous like space adventure and like weirdly like moving in parts um and it was nice to see that especially after like you know odyssey was has been a return to form but like between galaxy one and odyssey there was really and i i could say this having just replayed all of them there was really nothing of note in between and yes i include galaxy two in that we played uh mario new super mario brothers wii u deluxe for switch <laughs> or whatever the fuck that is uh sam and i played through that whole game this year actually as well and i can confirm it's nothing it's <laughs> that, that's that's a little unfair to be clear uh it is it is fine uh we had a grand time with it playing together but like it is it is it is fine overall like there is nothing particularly memorable about it. and i think we hundred percented it too like we oh beat man that game uh <laughs> but like we we had a great time playing it together but yeah as a game it is not a whole lot yeah, and, and like, I mean, I even tried to play the new Super Mario Bros. games, and I got, like, two worlds into the first one. I'm just like, I can't do this and moved <laughs> on. Just cause, like, not even because it was terrible, because they were also samey. So, like, I mean, Galaxy 1, like, it's it's definitely, it's funny, because I think that, like, both It and Sunshine um, are in different ways, like, sort of, like, flawed, beautiful little things in very different ways. Like, Sunshine's just really unpolished, whereas maybe Galaxy's a little too polished in some places and that, like, all the edges are sanded off. But, like, man, that, like, atmosphere, that, like, you know, new direction that they were going in like you know that's the good shit you know I, i'm finally i finally have been won back over by by galaxy one the, pro- the prodigal son has returned huzzah well let's tap this off uh with what is probably going to be the least surprising thing in the fucking world given that uh it is pretty much everyone's game of the year so surprise surprise 
Hades is a really fucking great game. Um, everyone talks about how wonderful it is, and I cannot echo that enough. It is a roguelike dungeon crawler for literally everyone, and I mean that including people who don't like roguelike dungeon crawlers. Sam could not give less of a shit about either of those genres, uh, and she's put some 30 hours into this game. There are just incredible character beats to it. The narrative throughout it is actually good. Like, it's a roguelike with an actual story based around dying and, like, trying again. And, like, I, I found the story to honestly be somewhat weak, but, like, the gameplay makes up for it, the the basically how it progresses makes up for it and here's the thing the characters make up for it this game is filled to the brim with just absolutely fucking astonishing amazing fleshed out well thought out interesting characters Zagreus as a protagonist is wonderful he's got depth he's got nuance he's interesting I want to kiss Thanatos on his stupid dead lips uh, <laughs> Skelly is sardonic and weird and wonderful I want fucking Megara to step on me and <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, that is very much in line with the game, and I am playing into it. I, I I realize that that's the whole thing. I'm kidding. I just need to get in front of that right now. Um, you know, these are some powerful characters. When Sean's talking about his husbandos and waifus on the show, yeah. he, he, his brain rot hasn't set in as badly as mine yet. So you know it's some powerful stuff. No, it, it, it's it's great. Uh, and like as I said, the characters are all very, very wonderful. The gameplay is excellent. Uh, and genuinely, even if you think that you don't like roguelikes or you don't like dungeon crawlers, you will will like Hades that is the 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 core of Hades is that it has something in it for literally everyone and makes even the parts that you think you wouldn't like fun and interesting by rewarding you in ways that you don't expect it to pick it up just pick it up and play it it's on switch it runs perfectly fine on switch it runs great on switch play it on pc it's got cross save now play it on every console who cares play Hell Hades yeah. so yeah play Hades well, I guess in the spirit of, of your game of the year, I, d I don't really have like a game of the year so much. So I just want to mention. Well, and to be fair, uh, my game of the year is actually probably post void. Uh, oh, OK. OK. Hades just rules. Oh, I, oh, I see. I mis I misunderstood. Uh, but. Hades is everyone else's game of the year for good reason. I understand why, but I love post void and it will live in my brain for a long time. Well, that's fair. Uh, yeah, don't 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 allow me to put words in your mouth. I'm glad I'm glad you corrected me there. But um, so I, I guess in that spirit, I don't so much have a game of the year because, like I said, I did a lot of like deep dives, like playing old shit. Um, like I, I mean, honestly, the game that like I enjoyed the most and like got the most out of this year was probably uh like Hyrule Warriors, but you know, depending on that standard. Um, but the uh, I want to mention not a game, but uh. I the, the 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 show that I watched that left the biggest impact on me that completely surprised me and actually its final season did come out in 2020 which was a complete coincidence because I didn't like seek it out because it had a uh because it had the final season coming out I actually had no idea the show wasn't even done because the first two seasons were a little bit old so what had happened was I finished uh FMA and Death Note and I, I was knew that like I still had a few more like classics to get off on my list, but I wanted to take a break uh, from like, you know, just burning through all those and watch something a little bit more contemporary. And uh, I approached my my guy, my my own personal like bearded anime man. And I was like, all right, all right, pal, uh, like you're let's do like a BuzzFeed quiz uh, like you're you're going to like. He basically had me answer a bunch of questions and he and his infinite knowledge like spat out a few recommendations for for me to watch. And uh, the one that he recommended that if he hadn't, if the title was so terrible that I never would have watched this in a million years. But I'm so glad that he did. And I'm so glad that I watched it. Um, my teen romantic comedy snafu. Uh, terrible. Okay. title. Yeah. Terrible. title. Yeah. Like you would think that like. It's a really cringy, like, you know, ooh, like, kawaii, like, senpai, like, you know, terrible, like, anime humor show. Um, it's actually more of, like, a romantic drama. Like, there are funny elements, but I wouldn't call it, 
like a rom-com in the way that we think of like a rom-com, you know, and like the characters are all really textured. It's actually like mostly a show about like navigating difficult social situations and like social intelligence and like, you know, the, the the sometimes malicious subtleties behind like seemingly benign interactions. Uh, the characters are really rich and really great. Um, it's really sweet. Like, you know, the first season visually is fine, but like, um, the, you know, the second season onward is like fucking beautiful. Like even just watching the OP for the second and third season, like makes me feel things, uh, like really, really came out of nowhere on me and made a big impression. And I'm glad that I watched it in time for the third season to air so i could watch it to completion like it's all done now you can watch the whole thing on crunchyroll and have and have a great old time um i i i i sean i know this doesn't mean anything to you although i do recommend this show as well but like if you're a fan of toradora um it's got that vibe like there's a lot of like shitty like harem like romance light novels and light novel adaptations uh this is like hey what if we made one of those and it was actually good <laughs> and actually had good characters um yeah really really surprised uh like don't you know so the, don't you, you can't judge a book by its cover and you can't judge a show by its title sometimes i suppose is the lesson here uh so i just really want to recommend it if you want something that's not like too heavy but still has a bit of meat on its bones and is still, you know, it's just sweet. I wanted a sweet little romance and that's what I got. So cool. Uh, I just want to really quick while I'm thinking about it, slot in one more game, just as kind of an honorable mention, uh, especially right now uh, in the, in the wake of the cyberpunk fiasco. Um, <laughs> Cloudpunk is great. Uh, it is a weird little voxel game. I reviewed it for 25 years later site back when, uh, and I highly recommend it. If nothing else, it does stuff that is really interesting. It's very philosophically oriented, uh, and it's not perfect. It's got some flaws to it, but you know what? If you're looking for a, a cyberpunk vibe fix and you don't want to play CDPR's nonsense, and I respect <laughs> that, uh, and in fact, respect you for doing so, um, yeah, pick up Cloud Punk. It's great. The devs are wonderful and they've been like watching things and watching responses and updating the game accordingly and like adding new features that people I, I didn't even see anybody asking for, but like, hey, this would be a cool feature. And you know what? It is. So uh, play Cloud Punk, especially because there's one, there's some stuff in there too that just like really hit home in ways that like I'm still thinking about the consequences of my actions because the game does a very interesting thing where it just makes you sit with your actions as opposed to being like ding 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 the city will remember that uh which, do you feel like a hero yet you 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 yeah no it doesn't do that it basically is like here's this thing make your decision and now take a slow drive back to where you started uh and basically in doing so your car ai dog it's way cuter than it sounds um is like do you think you made the right decision and like raises some philosophical implications and just like now sit with that and think about what you have done. Uh, and like, it, it, it's just really interesting in that way. Like it, it doesn't slap you on the wrist for any decisions. It's just like, you know, are you happy with what you have done? You don't know where it's going to turn out. You, no one does. Uh, and you know, I, I like that a lot. I think it, it does some interesting stuff in that regard. So shout outs to cloud punk, just as an honorable mention, play cloud punk. Well, Sean, that's a, you know, that's a good honorable mention. That's a good thing to bring up. And that brings up the most important thing of all, you know, the truly movie of the year 2020, the one that asked the deep questions, the one with the with the cyberpunk aesthetic, uh, you know, truly the movie of a generation. It didn't come out in 2020, but we watched it in 2020. And, uh, you know, I dare say it's one of the most important films of our age. Jackson, if the words out of your lip are chappy, I'm hey, motherfucking chappy. <laughs> Chappy understand consciousness. Oh, well, I got two last things I want to talk about really quick. If you're okay with that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all out. You know, that's that's all I got for you. Well, I'll be, I'll, I'll be, I'll be right quick with these. I'll be a little bit longer with one of them, but one of them I, I am gonna just blast through really quick. Uh, and I got really into Pokemon card collecting here for a bit, uh, and it wasn't the greatest thing to get into. It wasn't a great habit. I spent 
probably more money on it than I should have. Uh, <laughs> but like it was, it brought me some joy in a way that I hadn't in a long time. It like was like, hey, what if I was a kid but could spend money on things? Uh, so that was kind of great. And like I played the card game with Sam, and the card game is actually pretty okay. I think I still prefer Magic, but you know what? Fuck, if you're looking for a card game to pick up, pick up Pokemon. It's not terrible. I like I, I had a very Pokemon year in general. So yeah, just you, a quick you, shout. you just need that sometimes. I go through like big Pokemon phases on and off too, so I get it. Yeah, Pokemon card game, pretty decent. Uh but genuinely the thing that brought me the most joy in 2020, bar none, is DMing a tabletop campaign. Uh it has been such an absolute treat to run multiple campaigns at this point because my previous campaign ended with my <laughs> fucking buffoons of players deciding that the only solution was to take a grenade launcher to a fictional police station. And I went, I don't know how to fix this. Uh, and so the campaign ended. For, for, our, for our dear listeners, um, you may be surprised to learn, I was not the primary facilitator of that campaign's destruction. I played a, I played a role, certainly. But that was, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable saying that was not my fault. <laughs> uh, you know... I agree with Jackson on this one, <laughs> uh, but like even even in that nonsense, I had a great time doing that. And like, I think that this year I've just really discovered how much I fucking love DMing. It is all the fun of playing the game, but also I get to play everyone and shape the world as I see fit. Uh, so I fucking love it. I've been having a great time DMing. Uh, so if I, I highly recommend finding someone to learn how to play a tabletop RPG with and finding somebody to DM. And if you're looking for something simpler, Monster of the Week is a super simple uh, system to learn. It's just two D6s, so you don't need all those D20s and like there's not a bunch of crazy modifiers or anything like that. And not only that, it's easy to ignore half the rules because you can just fucking basically write fan fiction with your friends and that is absolutely wonderful so yeah pick up a tabletop rpg i had a great time with it and i genuinely love dming as it turns out so that's that's my big thing that's my biggest thing you know that's a great biggest thing and you know what that might actually be my biggest thing too because sean i have not had so much fun with a tabletop campaign genuinely since i like finished dming mine like fucking years ago at this point i've been having an absolute blast especially with uh the resurrected campaign we've been doing and the, the first one was a wacky fucking time too no better bonding experience with friends than a nice good rollicking like you know tabletop group and sean you've been doing excellent work my friend Ah, yes. There is truly little better for bonding than when one player shoots off the arm of another player accidentally. <laughs> ah, yes. Friendly, <laughs> friendly bonding. You know, this campaign is so great. There's so many dank fucking memes and none of y'all get to see it. This is this is, you know, private friendship going on. We're not selling our friendship for fucking content, you pigs. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, that's all I got. Same. You know, I think, you know, the, you know, things were things were bad, but they were also pretty good, too. <laughs> there was some good stuff this year. And uh, please take to heart if you're looking for anything to, to get into that might bring you some joy. There was a solid list for you. You got all genres of video games, movies, TV shows, books. We talked about books. What concept? Uh, as well as things you can do in real life. So, yeah. If you're looking for something, refer back to Horsies 2020, in which we forego the horsies and instead just talk about things that made us happy this year, which is the the main ethos of the horsies in some regards, but also we've also talked about just terrible things that we've done in the horsies. So, you know, <laughs> get some, you lose some. You know, I mean... She was miserable enough. We didn't need to like hash out like the worst of the year because everyone I mean, everyone fucking knows, you know, even in movies, everyone fucking knows. I feel like so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, next week, we're still going to be around, as we, we mentioned on our previous uh, fucking uh, update episode. If you haven't listened to a you definitely should. It'll let you know what's going on with everything. We really don't know what's going on right now for a number of reasons that we're not going to get into let's just say 2020 threw me one last curveball guys 
so we'll be around for a bit yet. Uh, so next week, we're going to be continuing our Neil Blom camp exploration and talking about District 9, mostly because we mentioned it uh, when we were talking about Chappie and then realized that we didn't know what we were talking about in January. So I guess we're starting with District 9. Fuck it. Who cares? Nothing matters. <laughs> What, you think the next year is going to be better because there's a vaccine? You fools. We're starting the year with Neil Blomkamp. We're ruining it for everybody. I've been Sean McKenna. Find me on Twitter at Sean underscore McKenna. I've been Jackson Keller. Find me on Twitter at Jackson J. Keller. You'll know it's me because, uh, you know, my buddy Sam photoshopped me with a Sephiroth wing saying I will never be a memory, which makes me giggle. <laughs> Find the podcast at BADH underscore cast. Uh, we have a Patreon. The Patreon is still going to be paused. Uh, it's over at patreon.com slash BADH cast. If you want to go take a look at it, I suppose. I don't really know how it works when it's paused. Fuck it. Uh, but, you know, go take a look. We got bonus episodes up there. We had one more bonus episode go live before the end of the year in which we just talk about the great things that the horse cast has done for us and the great media that we have watched and experienced throughout it uh especially after our thanksgiving episode in which we just talked about the things that made us miserable so it's a nice we, we have like two nice little just Mwah, we love you we love what we do kisses for the end of the year that hopefully will spark some joy as opposed to misery well said friend well said Thank you to loads of high reviews for our theme song and a suicide alternate takeoff the album High Octane Low Expectations. They're wonderful band. You should go support them however you can. Buy their music, stream their music, support them on Bandcamp. Also, thanks to RiffFabulousLaterSay.com. There's a little button of us in the corner you can go click on. But you should also definitely check out everybody else doing some really talented writing. There's just great people writing about literally fucking everything over there. Go read it. Uh, normally, I would say next week we're going to talk about District 9, but I already did that. So, Chappy understand allegory. Bye. Don't you go